today's lecture. And so in today's lecture, our so it's the second lecture of revenue. The main focus of today's lecture is going to be around uh, step two, right? So we did we did step one yesterday, and we, we're going to recap step one a little bit uh, today, just to make sure that we all sort of on the same page. But uh, the main um, push behind today's lecture is going to be step two, and step two, remember, is identifying that that performance obligation, um, and so. The sections of the textbook that are that are important for today's lecture is basically 140, page 140 um, to page uh, 143, uh, and all of these examples are super super important. We're not going to do them in detail in class, uh, and that's because I want you to have um, some sort of example that you can do on your own, um, and and um, you know, sort of like play around with and get wrong and and that sort of stuff before you start the tutorial, right? Because the tutorials are going to be a little bit more, you know, um, higher grade. I want you to have sort of a, an easy one to play around with and build your confidence and then you go to the tutorial and and hopefully it doesn't smack you down, right? <laughs> so, so that's sort of um, the idea. Um, that's sort of the idea, yeah. Okay, uh, let's have a look. So what does it mean to have an unconditional right to something? It means that no one can take away your, your right with a legal claim. So there's no other legal claim to it. You have a legal right to getting it. Uh, where did you, what sort of are you, in what context are you asking this question? Is it related to revenue or is it something else? You just pop your answer in the chat there from Lani. Okay, cool. So, uh, so today we are moving along with our sort of um, in our in our plan. And so, oh, this is the last one is not supposed to be stuck off presentation of revenue that we're still gonna sort of work on a little bit. Um, so this one we have not done yet. I'm just gonna put a cross there. To done that in blue. Um, so so yeah. But um, in terms of oops, uh, that one we've done. That one we've done. This one we're still going to do. Um, and and. Um, yeah, and so then the the main bulk, as I said, of this sort of lecture is going to be in part three, right? So that's sort of what also we're going to focus on today, uh, part three. Um, and remember, just to recap, just to sort of um, revise, right? What we want to be able to do is we want to be able to discuss firstly, right? Super important, right? Super important want to be able to discuss, we want to be able to calculate and then account for any um, revenue that arises, right? And like I said, you're going to see the general entries are not super difficult and, and you sort of will understand that from yesterday's lecture where we just sort of passed, you know, uh, either it's, I mean, it's either revenue received in advance or it's, or it's revenue, right? So mm, it's sort of easy. Um, but the important thing is understanding why, right? The discussion bit, that's the important bit, right? Cool, right. So yesterday, what did we discuss yesterday, right? So, so this is sort of a, um, it's, it's a you, you're not gonna find the slide in the ones that I've uploaded. I will upload this fresh copy uh, when I'm done. And that's sort of, that always, you'll find that always happens with sort of my, my slides, I will upload the first version that you guys will sort of download and, and come to the lecture with. Um, can everyone hear me? Just give me a thumbs up in the chat if you can hear me. Okay, there, there are some people that can't hear me. Um, okay, um, so back to what I was talking about. Step Step one, we did yesterday, 
and um, this is basically just a summary of, of step one. Uh, and like I said, the slide is not available in the copy that you've downloaded. Um, I'm going to, at the end of each topic, I will, I will delete that old version of the slides and re-upload this new version. And this sort of new, these new slides that you see coming about are just sort of slides that I either have put in there to answer a question that someone's asked me, or um, there might be uh, situations where I've gone through the slides and I was like, oh, I think this can be improved or that can be improved. And I've sort of done it so that when, when we chat about it in class, it's sort of there. And then I'll, I'll, upload, I'll upload the updated version um, uh, as we get to the end of the topic. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about step one. So in step one, we said that we wanted to be able to identify the contract. We must be able to identify the contract that we've got with our customers. And so the sort of the, the principle behind step one is we must have a contract, right, that, that has some sort of legal weight to it, right? Legally enforceable is the word that we used yesterday. Must have a contract and it must be with a customer and remember we said things like it, it can't be with ourselves it, it must be with someone that's willing to pay for the goods or services that we're giving them and so uh, there must be this idea of a consideration or, or, or money exchanging hands right uh, and we and so in the discussion we also sort of excluded things like non-monetary transactions specifically non-monetary transactions between people in the same business uh, industry um, and, and so those, that's sort of the, the overarching principle uh, to step one. We must be able to identify a contract and it must be with a customer and there must be some sort of legal weight to it, right? And then in our discussion of, um, so that's the principle. In our discussion, we came across these um, five criteria that need to exist for a contract. Now, remember again what I said, these criteria are not IFRS 15, they are step one only. This is only for step one, right? So, so this, these five criteria are only for step one. Don't get it confused with the, you know, step one, two, three, four, five that we've got in IFRS 15. This is within one of the steps. Okay, so the five criteria for contract. And sort of the stuff that we said is that we want all of the parties, uh, firstly, we want two or more parties, and then we want those parties to agree to the contract. Uh, sorry, just give me a minute. My earphones went flying. Um, so we want the people to agree to the contract, so so that's the important bit, right? So uh, the word that was used is is approved, and then also we can sort of say the word committed uh, to the contract, right? So it's binding. And then in order for the contract to be workable, legally workable, for it to have some sort of legal uh, importance, we need to be able to identify what are the rights and obligations. And when we talk about rights and obligations, we're talking about um, sort of what are the uh, um, things that we need to do in the contract what goods are we giving to the to the person what services are we providing to the person so so those are sort of the rights and obligations we must identify both people's rights and obligations not only not only ours um, and then we must be able to identify the payment uh, 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 that that's uh, encompassed in the contract right we said that there must be some commercial substance. And remember that idea behind commercial substance is then means that there must be an exchange of value somehow, right? So either uh, the risks of a specific item is changing. So the, so the risks associated with owning that item is changing, um, right? And you can sort of think about it like when you guys buy your first car, the day you drive it off the lot, is the day that the car becomes yours. So as you can just drive it off the lot and the first at the first robot, someone can knock you and, and the car can be written off. You can't sort of then take that car that's been written off back to the dealer and say, um, you know, it didn't really last me very long. I want a refund, right? Um, so, so, uh, so, so that sort of commercial substance is important. When do the risks and rewards transfer to the 
to the customer in the contract and when does the right to um, ask for payment or ask for for consideration transfer to the supplier let's call that person the supplier in the contract right so that sort of commercial substance that exchange of value it doesn't need to be an exchange of money it just needs to be the transfer of value that happens right so that's the commercial substance that's part four of the criteria uh, for a contract and then finally the, it must we must have um, the hope we must have an expectation that we th there is going to be some co uh, commercial transfer right so there must be the hope that we're going to get paid there must be the hope that we that, that we're going to get the money and so sort of in that in that last one what that last criteria cuts out is um a sort of related party transactions and think about related party transactions um you know um uh, th think about you, yourself and your parents or yourself and your grandparents right so 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 you go to your grandparents you say you know um, um i need to buy this accounting textbook and it's really expensive can you just you know loan me a little bit of money so the person like lends you the money but the person sort of realizes and and you sort of know implicitly that you know you paying back the money is not really going to happen soon or ever like you know so so that sort of it cuts out those sorts of related party transactions because the, with the related party transaction you're never really sure that you're going to get the money right so so that's what that last criteria sort of cuts out um and then so so now that we've got the criteria to identify if there's a contract we need to ask ourselves you know what happened if the criteria are not met right and then we said if, if it's not met we can't record any revenue, but we can record this thing called a refund liability. Um, and then the other, the flip side of that is what happened if it was met, but is no more met, right? And then we said, we're gonna stop recognizing revenue, although the revenue that has been recognized won't be reversed. And then any future income uh, from this contract is going to be uh, recorded under a refund liability. Um, and, and then we need to continually assess the situation to make sure that um, you know we don't now start meeting it again, start meeting the criteria again, right? So so that sort of was was uh, the dealio with the with the criteria, and then there were a few other important things that we just spoke about. We said that even when the criteria are met, there are instances where we can be deemed not to have a contract, right? And and uh, remember when we were talking about that situation where it's deemed not to exist is something like where we can cancel it without a penalty, blah, 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 blah. So you guys are gonna read that up a bit more. I think it's on page 136. Yeah, 136. Um, and then the other thing that we spoke about was combining of different contracts, right? So putting contracts together, if they, if they arise between the same people around about the same time and relate to more or less the same, um, uh, item uh, so we combine them into one one contract right to, as we said to try and avoid uh, the lawyers ticking the accountants right so that's what that's why we want to want to have these provisions okay so any questions so far about step one right that's a fairly thorough recap of step one if you have any questions um, you're more than welcome to drop your hand and your mic um, or if you want to do it the snail mail way, you can you can type it out. Okay. Um, again, let's just recap. Let's just recap sort of what are what are our core principles. Our core principle when throughout IFRS 15 um, is that we want to make sure that we recognize revenue right that depicts the substance of economic transactions over the form right remember we want to move away from what the legal format is and look at the economic substance right we want to record the economic or commercial substance um and so and so uh, that's our core the guiding principle is that the revenue that we recognize must actually reflect what is going to happen and what is expected to happen in this transaction, OK? 
okay? So that's that's sort of the guiding principle. Um, and then, like I said yesterday, we chatted about, about step one. And then today, we're going to focus in uh, on step two. And so step two is all about the performance obligation. And remember, I said performance obligation is just a fancy word for saying goods and services, right? They say performance obligations because it cannot, it's not only goods and services, it can be sort of other things like intangibles or whatever. But um, intangibles are assets. And I realize now that you guys haven't done intangibles yet, but intangibles are assets that are not physical. Um, so, so those are. Um, so, so that's sort of what we're going to focus on today, right? And the key sort of principle for today's lecture, right, and the thing that we want to leave today's lecture with is that we must be able to identify distinct, right, that word distinct performance obligations, right? Distinct performance obligations. I'm going to tick it there on our on our page, distinct performance obligations. Now, the way um, IFRS uh, 15 describes performance obligations is that it says, listen, performance obligations are actually a type of promise, right? They're a type of promise that is made to, to, um, to the customer, right? Uh, the key is that when we are recording it, it must be distinct, right? Um, as a good or service, right? And then, and then the other thing is, it says, you know, sometimes you can have goods and services that are not distinct individually. They're not, and we're going to discuss this topic of distinctness, right? But, but just bear with me for now. They're not distinct individually, right? Instead, those types of uh, um, the the. Uh, those types of things are only distinct when you group them together with some other um, with some other goods and services. So, 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 so we can have either individually distinct goods and services, or we're going to have groups of goods and services that are distinct as as a group together. Right. So that's that's the important sort of takeaway from from here. Um, I just want to. Uh, while still talking about performance obligations, I'm, we're still here at the top. I want to focus in on these words, and you notice I skipped over it when I first introduced it, right? Uh, I want to focus in on these words of implicit versus explicit. So, so implicit is with an I, explicit with a with an E. Um, uh, just let's just define the words um, before we start talking about them in the context of accounting. So explicit. Uh, basically means that something is very obvious or out there, right? Uh, explicit uh, is, is out there. Uh, and it's, it, it, it comes sort of from the word external, basically. Um, and, and, so, and so it's, out, it's clear, right? The, the, there's a clarity of understanding around something that's explicit. Implicit is, uh, and implicit comes from the word imply, right? Uh, implicit sort of means something that's uh, not that clear, right? It's not clearly set out. Instead, it is uh, intended. There's an intention. And, and you, you sort of hear this when you hear uh, people talking uh, uh, about, about legal matters. They say, we need to look at the spirit of the law. What does the spirit of the law want us to, to do? You know? So, so what's, what is the underlying intention of the law? Um, and, so, and so that's sort of what implicit means it's something where it's not overt uh, meaning it's not uh, 100 clear but it is there and it, it is intended to be there so so that's sort of what what those words mean now it's easy to identify explicit uh, prom promises right because they're gonna it, when something is explicit it means it's clearly written out in the contract right so so that sort of um that, that's not going to be a problem, right? It's going to say, you know, I want 10, um, um, 10 printers. But, oh, cool. I, I got that, right? I, that's clear. Um, uh, but with, with implicit, because there's a sort of, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, a judgment. There's a professional judgment that's required to identify something that's implicit. Um, 
we need to look at different criteria. Now, now the criteria that is set out for us uh, in IFRS 15 says that we need to look for um, customary business practices. So what are sort of the business practices that are happening in uh, this type of business in this country? What are the sort of business practices that are happening there? And can we draw anything telling us about the implicit nature of these promises, right? Um, and then and then we do this test. We, we always test for this implicit uh, uh, obligations at the beginning of the contract. So at the inception of the contract, right? So that's an important thing. Um, at the inception, we're going to talk about what happens if something is added on after the inception. But at the inception of the contract is sort of when we want to uh, look at it. Then, um, so so the so, so the first one is what are the customary business practices, meaning what sort of generally happen and happens in this country in this industry uh, with regard to this type of contract, uh, and then we need to look at it at the beginning of the contract. We then need to ask ourselves what are the expectations of the customer. Notice what they're doing here. They're, they're putting you. They're putting you as the accountant in the shoes of the customer. What are what is the customer thinking, right? Uh, how is the customer viewing the contract, right? Do they have a valid expectation? Notice the word valid or reasonable. Do they have a valid or reasonable expectation um, related to this contract uh, and this? Sorry, this implicit obligation, um, and then. Yeah, so so uh, do they, in that valid expectation, do they expect that the entity is the one that's going to fulfill this obligation so or, or this promise? So those are sort of the things we want to look at when we're dealing with implicit, uh, uh, implicit obligations, right? Performance obligations. Okay, so, so uh, that's sort of what we're going to look for when we're dealing with implicit uh, obligations. Now, I want to focus in on this word distinct, right? So when we talk about something that's distinct, we then come down here and we've got also criteria for, for distinctness. So this is talking about distinctness, right? And the first sort of thing that they um, uh, talk about in distinctness is, is they talk about, you know, what, what, what is, what's happening in the contract, right? What, what, what's happening in the contract? And what sort of the business practices around it, and so th those are sort of the, the the things that we will keep in mind when we when we're discussing distinctness. But we're going to go on to more defined criteria just now, right? So that's very vague um, criteria. It's sort of the principle behind behind it. And then finally, we we can have situations where um, uh, things are made to look fancy in the in the marketing sense, right? So you might have a situation where uh, the marketers decide, oh, let's say, um, you know, we offer the best service. Uh, we offer free maintenance or, you know, uh, come and get a loan with our bank and you, you won't pay for the first three months, stuff like that, right? So those sorts of marketing uh, um, type things, right? Those sorts of marketing type things also can give rise to uh, performance obligations. No, notice I said also can, meaning that it's not always the case, but it can sort of give rise if we do those things where we create that expectation where it's within the business practices and where the customer expects that the entity will will sort of um, will sort of uh, 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 satisfy the, the performance obligation. Now, remember, I said to you um, when we are talking about implicit, so this, this sort of thing here is related to the implicit nature of um, uh, the implicit nature of an obligation. Remember, I said that um, we would do the test um, at the beginning, right? Um, so the, the next thing that I want to say is if at the beginning, we did the test, and this sort of implicit thing is not there, right? It's it wasn't there at the beginning. Then, if it arises just after the contract has had already been concluded, 
then it wouldn't be included as a performance obligation. Instead, it would be included as a liability uh, that we need to meet, right? So we wouldn't allocate a, a portion of revenue to it. And when we satisfy it, we wouldn't then recognize that revenue, right? So it's going to be sort of a liability. Uh, the, the next thing that I want to talk to you about now, now keep that in mind, just uh, let that marinate with you a little bit, right? The next thing I want to talk to you about is if there are certain activities um, that are required in order to create and satisfy an obligation, but they are not an obligation or a good or service of their own, they will not be distinct and therefore there will not be um, a separate performance obligation. Let me give you an, uh, an example. We have, you're going to buy a car, right? And you know, as part of buying a car, when, when you take ownership of the car, the car has to be registered in your name, right? So it's an admin process, right? Um, so that admin process, right, is, not an obli it's not a good or service that that the car, that the car salesman is selling do you understand it's not something that the car salesman sells on a regular basis you know registering vehicles for people so as a result it's not a separate performance obligation it can't be distinct and so then we fall into that second category of groups right we need to group it with the car so when you go to buy a car the performance obligation is the car but within that car is these sorts of other uh, things that come about. Um, they're not separate obligations. They're going to be within an obligation. So that's sort of how we look at it, right? And so that's why I say we don't include these as separate obligations. We sort of, they, they, are, they are part of, a, of already existing obligation. Okay, any questions so far? Everyone seems very quiet. I don't know whether I've lost you or... I don't know. I don't know whether anyone's there. Anyway, proceeding along. <laughs> oh, they're listening. Okay, good. That's good. Um, so remember, we just spoke now about sort of grouping the goods, grouping the goods and services together in the second, where we said series of goods and services, the second um, sort of line. Uh, now we want to. I just want to talk about that just a, a briefly, a little bit more. Um, so if we, and we're going to talk about distinctness just now again, but if we have a performance obligation that uh, does not meet the requirement of being distinct, right? So we can't, it's not meeting the distinctness uh, requirement. We need to then uh, start combining the goods and services, right? And we combine the goods and services, and when doing, and when combining the goods and services, we need to start looking at, you know, what are the patterns of transfer between uh, uh, our company and the customer? What are sort of the patterns that, that that are being transferred? And when do the requirements start to be met? Right? When do the requirements start to be met? So, so we uh, we need to start asking that, right? And so that's why we said things like administrative um, activities uh, uh, are, not, are not performance obligations on their own, right? The, the administrative activities, they need to be combined into something else uh, to, make, uh, to, to make it valuable. And you're going to see how, uh, for example, administration activities is never going to meet the requirements of distinctness. Okay, we're going to talk about distinctness just now, but you'll see how it never meets that requirement. Um, and so we need to start combining and, and, and binding up these goods until such a time that we reach a series of goods or services that does meet the requirement of being distinct. Okay, so, so that's sort of the idea behind the series of goods. We, we, we just continue combining until, until we meet a performance obligation um, and that's distinct. Okay, now this is the sort of the bulk of the work. Right, and this is the, the important but distinctness, right? Something being distinct, and and I am. Uh, let me just see. I am on page 141 now, right? So so if you're following in on, uh, in your textbook, 
we're sort of at 141 and we're talking about distinctness. And you're going to see that there are two criteria, right? Um, two criteria for distinctness. All right. Can, can you sort of see a pattern between, between what's sort of going on here? We had step one, and in step one, we had five criteria, right? And then we've got step two, and in step two, we've now got two criteria. Um, can you sort of see a pattern? It seems like each of the steps is going to have some, some sort of requirement, some sort of criteria, some sort of thing that we're going to be discussing, uh, some sort of important meaty thing that we talk about, right? And so, and so just keep that in mind going forward, right? And so uh, this uh, distinctness has two criteria. The first criteria of distinctness is that it must be able to earn some sort of value on its own, right? Uh, it must be able to earn some sort of value on its own uh, to our customer, okay? Um, so, so that's the, the first criteria. I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that more just now. And the next criteria is it must be definable, separately definable in the contract. We must be able to separately identify it in the contract. Um, right. So the first one, if you if you think about the way it's written, the first one, it must be able to earn some sort of benefit by the customer. It's that's very broad, right? That's very 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 broad, right? It must earn some sort of benefit, and then you think to yourself, well, if this is a business, right? Businesses are in the in the sort of and excuse the pun in the business of making benefits. Right, so so surely that criteria is going to be met fairly easily, right? So that first one is a very broad criteria, and then we sort of go down the funnel to criteria two that sort of ties us down to our specific situation and says, in this contract, is it definable? Right? So we sort of come from a very broad uh, criteria to a more defined, tight criteria. Um, sort of harder to meet criteria. Um, okay, so let's first look at that first one in detail, the first requirement in detail, right? The first requirement of, of um, uh, being able to earn some sort of benefit or gain some sort of benefit on its own. So, so in order for something to gain benefit, um, we must have a situation where this good or service can be, um, you know, sold as a resource, right? Is readily available as a resource is the words that are used, right? Uh, we can either readily sell it or readily obtain it, um, um, all right? Uh, and then, so, so, so that's sort of the first criteria. There must be, uh, um, uh, it must be able to be sold or bought, right? And then the next criteria for those people that are studying economics is where do you sell or buy something, right? There, there must be a market for it, right? There must be demand. We can't just only be supplying it. There must be a demand for it. And so the next criteria is asking, you know, are you in an oligopoly or are you in a monopoly? So are there other entities that are able to sell this type of um, uh, this this type of thing? And so I think many of you guys, while you were still in school, you would have sort of heard that uh, in South Africa we have uh, a monopoly on electricity, right? Uh, that, that monopoly has slowly been uh, reduced um, by about 100 megawatts, where individual people can sell 100 megawatts to each other, um, which is, uh, I guess, around about a month's worth of electricity. I don't know. Um, but but um, you can't sell any more than that. So there is still a type of monopoly with ESCOM, right? And so um, if we were to, let's say, have a lot of electricity, uh, the question is, can we then readily sell it and, and, and will we be able to, let's say, buy it from someone else? And the answer to that is, is possibly no, right? Uh, because, because we can't sort of sell it easily. It's not a readily available resource. And we also can't sort of buy it from someone else except ESCOM in large amounts. So, so those are so, sort of the things that they're asking. So the, the second sort of one is asking, you know, are you in a monopoly or oligopoly? 
uh, where it would be hard to obtain this uh, good and service from someone other than your supplier. Um, right? um, then if we have a supplier and we're dealing with a series of goods, we need to ask ourselves, uh, is the specific obligation that we're looking at, is it normally sold separately? Right? Is it normally, is there a separate, uh, and you're going to see this when we talk about step three on Tuesday, is there a separate standalone price? Is there a standalone selling price? Um, and, and if there is a standalone selling price, that means it's regularly sold on its own, uh, and therefore there's a market to regularly sell it on its own. Um, and 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 the, the last one, and this is where I'm, I'm talking about the broadness of the criteria or the broadness of, of this, this first criteria. The last one says, we don't need to necessarily look at the purpose that this customer has bought it for, right? We, we, we're asking these questions very broadly, right? And we're looking more at the goods that are being bought as opposed to the customer that is buying it, okay? So that's what that last uh, thing is sort of telling us. It's telling us to redirect our focus away from the the goods and more to I'm sorry, away from the customer and more toward the toward the goods that, that are being purchased, right? And so those that sort of the guiding principles behind criteria one and meeting criteria one. Right. And when so so that's the first criteria. The second criteria, let's just recap. The second criteria talks about, and this is the more tight criteria. The second criteria talks about, is it um, definable? Is it separately definable? Meaning can, can we uh, um, identify it clearly uh, from the other promises or the other obligations in the contract, right? So, so now we're looking specifically at our contract. And uh, then uh, they have what we call negative um, sort of, uh, What's the word? Negative criteria? No, negative statements that, if met, will will mean that they are not definable, uh, separately definable in terms of the contract, right? So, so what what are sort of these statements? So you you're gonna find these statements on page 142 uh, in your textbook, and basically it talks about you know. Are these, when we look at the contract, do we see that the obligation is uh, uh, linked, uh, integrated with the other obligations? Are they very closely integrated, right? And if they're very closely integrated, then we sort of can't break them. It's not possible to break them up and sell them separately, right? Uh, in terms of this contract. So then it's not separately identifiable. The next sort of question they ask is, you know, um, uh, is are the are, is this obligation uh, going to be significantly modified in such a way that it cannot be sold to another uh, client? Uh, and if it is significantly modified, then we're going to struggle to break the the promises apart from each other. Uh, and then the last one is sort of is there a high level of uh, interdependence and interrelation between the different obligations that are in? Uh, that are in the contract. And if those criteria are met, then we can't say that the individual promises are separately identifiable as individuals, right? We need to um, sort of um, um, group them together and start to bind them together. Uh, and we're going to talk about binding them just now. Um, uh, and then, uh, so the important thing that we need to take away from the second criteria is that we're trying to look at uh, again, the individual characteristics of the promises uh, or, 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 or the um, uh, performance obligations, but we're doing so in the context of the contract that we have with us, right? So that's the important bit. We want to make sure that we look at the context uh, that we are of the contract that we're dealing with, right? So, so this specific contract, what is the nature? How does it relate to? And can we answer those questions? with uh, a no, right? So can we say, no, it's not integrated, no, it's not customized, and no, it's not interdependent. So so those um, th those are sorts of the things that were the guiding principles when, when looking at the second criterion. Um, 
so so that's sort of what, what it's all about right so so it's mainly about the contract and this is where um the legal opinions become very important right because the legal opinions are going to help us here a lot to, to uh, determine whether it's distinct or not okay so any questions that you have please don't um be afraid to pop them in the chat i'm going to move on though um just because i'm wo worried about time um okay so so uh, th this is sort of what i was talking about where those those indicators about whether something is uh, separately identifiable we, we need to answer no no to these questions right you know is the integration is it significantly um customized and this or this last one should also be in red let me just uh how do you change brush yep let's go to red this should also be in red yo that's very red <laughs> so this one should also have been in red um and so yeah is it highly de dependent on each other or is it highly interrelated to each other those are sorts of the questions that we need to ask and if our answers are no to these questions then they are separate performance obligations they're separately identifiable in terms of the contract so so even though we ask for legal opinions as accountants we need to apply these criteria the accounting criteria for identifying whether it's separately identifiable okay uh, and again like i was talking about binding or combining the crew the the different um goods and services we need to combine the different goods and services until such a point that we are able to meet those two criteria of distinctness right so until the the, the goods and services that we combine are able to earn money on their own they're able to be sold on their own or bought on their own um, and uh, the, in terms of the contract they, they are identifiable um, okay so that sort of uh, uh, how it needs to go and then and then the idea is that we can't uh, break it up it, it, it's meaningless if we break if we break the goods up okay now i want to just look at an example right and you're going to see um a similar example in your question book oh i don't know uh, my question I don't know where my question book is, but it's the example that talks about the um, software. So in your question book, there's an example that talks about software, and then it says, you know, the software in stage one to five is unusable and only becomes usable in stage six, right? And, and there they combined the different stages up together. Um, and so that's, this sort of example is similar, is going to be similar to that one. Uh, someone's asked a question. Let me just have a look. It says, yes, yeah, so we, we do mean the goods and services. Yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, in terms of the customization and integration, we're asking, are the goods that are in the contract uh, customized? Uh, are the services that are in the contract customized to, our, to, to, to this uh, customer or integrated? Um, th that's what we're asking. We're asking in terms of the contract, are the goods and services customized? We, they, they don't necessarily need to be goods and services at the same time in the same contract. Uh, so, so you can have just services and you can have an uncustomized service and a customized service, right? Uh, and sort of uh, the thing that we think about is uh, a haircut versus uh, someone designing a logo for for your company, right? So so when you go for a haircut, the the guy that's performing the the the, the haircut, um, and and this might not be the case with 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 um, um, sort of the ladies in the room, but but sort of for the guys in the room, it's more or less the same sort of haircut, right? He's gonna he's just gonna cut your hair, right? So it's just it's just like. He, regardless of the of the hair that's pro, provided him he's going to do more or less the same thing that's it's, it's sort of uncustomized um in a way uh, but but um when you design a company logo i can only design one logo at a time and that logo can't be used by other companies for obvious reasons right so so it's sort of very customized 
So in, in both those cases, there's sort of a service that's customized and a service that's not customized. Anyway, I think you guys get the picture. Uh, let's look at our example. Okay, so our example on the board there, it says, uh, an entity enters into a contract to manufacture and install customized equipment and provide maintenance services for a five-year period. The installation services included, sorry, include the, the integration of multiple pieces of equipment at the customer's facility in order for the equipment to operate as a single unit, right? The equipment cannot operate without installation, okay? The equipment cannot operate without installation. The entity sells the equipment and the installation services together, but the, does not sell the installation services separately. Right? Other venues, other vendors can provide the installation services, however, um, and it says the maintenance contracts are generally sold separately. So firstly, the question that I want to ask you is, how many promises can you identify in on the slide? How, you, you type a number out in the chat, uh, either one, two, or three. How many promises can you identify here in this in this uh, slide? On the slide, right? So someone said three. Let's just walk ourselves through it. So the first is the equipment. That's number one, right? The next is the installation, right? Number two, and the last is the maintenance service, number three. So there are three, there are three promises. Okay. So we first identify that there are three promises. The next thing that we need to look at is, are these promises distinct, right? So let's look at the first promise, right? The first promise is the equipment, right? So, so remember how to, let's, I'm gonna go back to our, to the slide here, right? So the first is, can the equipment benefit the client on its own? Right? Your answer is, is should be arriving in the chat. Can the equipment benefit the client on its own? Right? And the and, and the correct answer is no, it can't. Why are we saying it can't? Because the equipment is useless without installation. Right? There is no way that the customer is going to use it without installation. And because the customer can't use it, right, it's not going to. Um, it's not going to provide any benefit. Now, let, let, let's look at this, right? So let's look at the first criteria. We say, uh, is it red, readily available uh, resource? Um, you know, it might be a readily available resource. It's, it's not very clear. And also what's not very clear is whether we're dealing with a monopoly, right? But because they just use the word equipment, I think we can sort of say that, okay, you know, if it's, if it's just equipment, it's probably not a monopoly. Um, then is it sold normally separately? And the answer is no, it's not normally sold separately. And then the last sort of uh, guiding principle that we have here is saying, you know, are you actually looking at the client or are you looking at the goods? And, and I think we are looking at the goods when we say no, it's not, the good is not useful on its own. Right? The good is not used. So we're not, we're, not, we're not looking at how the client is planning to use it. We're looking just at the good. So I think when we look at the first criteria for, for the equipment, the answer is no. All right? No, it's not. Um, it's not. It's not. Um, uh, uh, what's the word? It's, it, it cannot provide economic benefits. Now, the, the way the criteria is set out is both need to be met, right? So, so both the uh, economic benefit needs to be gained and it needs to be separately identifiable. If you were, if we were just to talk about separate identifiableness of the equipment, would it be separately identifiable? And the answer is yes. So, so it would be separately identifiable. Uh, the equipment I'm talking only, only the equipment. Uh, but because we've missed uh, out on the first criteria, because we said no on the first criteria. Uh, uh, it's no, it, it can no more be distinct, right? It can no more be distinct. So we need to start now grouping it with something else, okay? So that's what we're going to do with, 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 with the equipment. 
But so just park the equipment in your minds one side, right? And I just want to talk uh, about the insulation. Now, just assume, right, for, for our purposes of this discussion, just assume that, that the, the insulation uh, is the only thing that we're selling, right? Just assume, right? So, so, so we sort of, uh, I'm sort of taking you out of this specific context, but I just, it's, it's an exercise that I want to do with you guys. So just assume that we're only selling the insulation, uh, installation. Uh, and then the question is, can the installation get economic benefits on its own? What's your answer? Can the installation get economic benefits on its own? You're going to say yes or no for me in the chat. Can can the installation uh, get economic benefits on its own? Right. And 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 the key to that the key to that sort of uh, answer uh, is is going to sit in in our in our guiding principles. Right. So so let's go here and we're going to say. You know, is it readily available? Well, it tells us that other people do the installation. Uh, where does it tell us? It tells us somewhere here. There, uh, there, there. there. See, uh, see number. Oh no, I've still got the highlight on. See there, it says other vendors can provide the installation services. So, so it is readily available. Um, we can then assume. Listen, we're not in in a monopoly. Uh, is it sold separately? Is it sold separately? What, 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 do, what, what do we um, um, what do we see here? We see no, it's not. It's not normally sold separately. Um, it's not normally sold separately. Uh, but the fact that other people are selling it separately also calls that into doubt. So it's not it's not normally sold separately in the context of this customer but in the context of the good and service it is sold separately so that's why this final principle here is important so here we we could have fallen into the trap of looking at it in the context of our customer and in the context of our entity so in the context of our entity it's not sold separately but it's clear that it is sold separately right uh, by another company. So, in fact, this criteria is met, or this principle is met. It is sold separately, generally sold separately, right? Um, so, 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 so we've got sort of a situation where all the criteria for the first criterion is met, right? Um, so, uh, the, the next one is, let's now move on to the contract. Right? Is it separately identifiable in the contract? Right? Um, and then, and then we, we read here, uh, it says, um, so, so the first sentence here, it talks about they're selling and installing. Right? So notice how the contract is worded. They're going to manufacture and install equipment right? and provide, and provide maintenance services. So in the terms of this contract, there's there's the manufacturing and installing of the equipment and then the maintenance services. So you can see in the terms of this contract, it's not clearly split. The, the contract doesn't split it. Later on in our discussion, it sort of talks about talks about a split, right? But the contract itself doesn't split it. The, uh, here, when, the, when it comes to... Uh, when it comes to this next thing, where they start describing the installation services, then we sort of uh, get get an idea that listen, it can be split in some circumstances, um, but but uh, the fact that um, the way the contract is worded makes us believe that the the equipment is useless without the installation and the installation is going to be useless without the equipment uh, makes us think that the first two criteria is the the um, the first two criteria uh, so the first two promises the installation and the equipment are integrated 
they're linked, they are interrelated. And what's the other one? Interrelated, modified or customized and integrated in terms of the contract. So in terms of this specific contract, the installation and the equipment are one performance obligation, right? So, so we're going to start to combine that when we are accounting for this contract. And then the final uh, performance obligation, the maintenance, we told that number one, the maintenance is generally sold separately. Um, uh, in this contract, it also makes us think that, that the maintenance is sold separately um, because it, it talks about the equipment and then it separately says that we also providing the maintenance services for the next five years. It also is separate because if you have a look at when the satisfaction of the obligation is going to happen, the equipment is going to happen at the time of installation. But the maintenance services are, is not happening at the time of installation and is not happening at the time that the equipment is being delivered. The maintenance services is happening over a period of five years. So that also tells us that there's little integration, there's little customization, um, and there's little interrelatedness between the, the maintenance services and the equipment and the installation. Okay, so in, in, that, in that situation, the requirement for the maintenance to be separate is met. So let's have a look at what at what our answer should look like, right? So it says um, uh, the goods cannot be used without installation, right? So then we know that we need to now attach the equipment to something because it hasn't met the criteria, the first criteria. But anyway, we'll talk about the distinctness in terms of the contract. It's very highly related. It's very um uh, uh, connected to 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 the installation and so therefore we have a situation where the equipment and the installation is considered to be one obligation and then the maintenance services because it's generally sold separately we're not customizing the maintenance service to a specific client it's um uh, sort of separate in terms of the contract um, so as a result, the maintenance services is going to be the second obligation. Any questions so far about, about what's sort of happening? Any questions about what's sort of happening? Okay, cool. So that, guys, that brings us to the end of today's lecture. Um, it's super important. Um, please make sure that you read the next section. So yes, there is going to be a large chunk of the next section that is left out. Uh, and, and sort of we say from page... So the overview, I don't want you to spend too much time reading the overview because the overview on page 143 talks a lot about collectability and we, we're not going to deal too much with collectability uh, but but read it but don't spend too much time don't get confused the important bits are in 7.2 where we talk about variable considerations um, then uh, so, so that's a little bit important but then when it comes to estimating the consideration and that sort of stuff those it's I mean, you can read through it, but I don't want you to get confused and, and bogged down um, uh, with it. So someone said, will the slides be available? I've sort of answered that question already. But um, yes, there, there are copies of, of the slides on uh, ClickUp. Uh, there's going to be an updated copy that's going to be put on ClickUp after the... Um, after we finish the lectures, uh, and the updated copy would have sort of uh, tweaks and stuff that I've made to the uh, to the to, to the slides. Um, do you have to look at specific questions? And the answer is, let me just just give me a minute. I'm getting my textbook, my my question book. Yes, the answer is yes. You have to look at specific. Um, questions for me. So if you have your textbook, uh, your question book available, just
just open your question book and I'll tell you which questions that we that you need to do for me for this weekend and then and then um, be ready for for Monday I mean Tuesday so uh, the first one is 4.3 question 4.3 spray needs to be done um, then question 4.8 needs to be done uh, that's Matthew question 4.8 you're going to leave out part C for 4.8 right uh, we're going to leave out part C then uh, question 4.9 alphabet is going to be done you're going to do both the parts there question 4.9 uh, yeah that's it so that's it yeah so 4.2 4.2 4.8, 4 4.9. 4 okay. Um, okay, let's, I'm going to stop the recording now because...